welcome you all back to another episode of Human Human Architecture uh, here from our coastal cosmopolitan city of Honolulu, Hawaii. And uh, if we can get the first picture up, which is also introducing my co-host to Soto. Hi to Soto. Hello, Martin, and hello everybody who happens to be watching. And we're going to look into what today? What do we see? Well, we're going to start out with uh, making some comparisons between yours and my respective cultures. And so we're making reference to German culture and Hawaiian culture. And on the left side of the screen, you see this kooky thing, which is a envelope that once contained what are called genuine Hawaiian ukulele strings made in Germany. So I don't know how that genuine Hawaiian gets in there. But as we've talked about, these, these two cultures do have some intermingling. And there's also the fascination that people in a culture have for another culture that they're not part of. So I was always fascinated by Volkswagens. And so I had a Volkswagen Beetle. And you can see me and my Volkswagen Beetle, and you can see the fate of my Volkswagen Beetle after it flipped on the freeway in 1978. Mm -hmm. But we also see a Volkswagen van parked at Kapiolani Park, surrounded by hula dancers. So there are those two German and Hawaiian connections right Absolutely. there. Absolutely, and through these objects, we're actually able, since post-contact, to sort of get an appetite for each other even more above and beyond imagination through tangibility, through things, right? Through objects. Absolutely. And as we were talking about, if you go back 100 years, people in Germany who were fascinated by the Hawaiian Islands would never have been able to get here back in those Absolutely. days. But nowadays, there is much more of an international connection, as we will see as we continue. And never mind, it might be slowed down because of the coronavirus. Yeah. But uh, regardless, you see this little map up there that shows you how, you how quick you can actually get from this one side of the world to the other one. Uh, a minimum of two planes. You go from one from here to the mainland on the west coast, and then one more, you end up in Frankfurt or in Munich. So let's go to the next slide um, to talk about how culture informs climate and vice versa. These are images from the top row is you and your skins. Your, and we're going to do a show about that topic. That's the one we work on for the longest. And the bottom is, is me. And in the, bit, in the middle is, is the reason why we're both here, because some now, six years ago, uh, I was fairly new to the island. I read in the newspaper on the title page that they're going to air condition all the schools, and I just had to get to know uh, Hardwick, our co-green colleague, show colleague, and he said, you want to discuss this on camera? And I said, sure, and uh, the rest is history. And so, um, you know, here we are as kids, and, and you know, within the realm of pedagogues, this sort of phase of before school. So preschool is the most important, right? This is where the foundations for what you become later on as a human being are laid. Right? That's right. That's right. And we see that uh, you in Germany were in the snow and I had a brief period in the snow as well. But most of the time I was in the tropics, but you only had a short period of time in the tropics or a warm time of year in Germany in a temperate climate because as you were just saying to me, 60% of the civilizations in the world and the population live in temperate zones, 40% in the warm tropical zones. So those two different types of climates really uh, speak to how architecture works and how architects and the people who live in buildings respond to those. And that's what we're gonna be talking about, how your family firm in Germany dealt with the different climates that are necessary and how the schools, for example, you were talking about preschools, how those work when you're dealing with those climates. Absolutely, and the bottom right, you can see at that short window of season of summer, you know, two to three months, we up on our rented roof terrace here, and this is the family fern. You see our father, Gunther, at the bottom right, and you see my sister, Cynthia, and you see myself. That's how it all started. Let's go to the next slide and share um, you know, again, what we were just talking about, if you talk to pedagogues, um, again, this is the time that's most influential. And we were just talking that while I experienced Sesame Street, you were a little too old. Yes. And the generations today, they don't even know that anymore. All they know is their iPads and they can watch whatever. But then there is a sort of anti-phenomenon of nature deprivation. And then the question is, how do we move on from there? And so, um, next slide. We've been talking about this, you know, here and there, making a reference. But now uh, we actually want to offer that if some people watching are interested, to actually take them there. And this would be a, a trip 
in the third week of January next year in 21. It includes Martin Luther King Day, so actually would only have to be away for four working days. It would be an intensive week, and what would we visit to Soto? Well, you would be visiting, if I understand correctly, the various uh, buildings that have been built by your family firm, Despang Architectures, or Architects. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be looking at three of those buildings today. They're specifically schools or preschools. And you pointed out, and I can see what you mean, those three skinny pictures at the top of the screen, the red, the yellow, and the black, resemble the colors that are used on the German flag, except they're in the wrong or the different order. And yeah. for this particular trip, when you said it's going to be in January, I said, but January is so cold. And you pointed out that actually this is a, a good thing for people from here to go and experience the cold and the snow of that time period to see how these buildings respond to that, because that's really crucial in their energy usage. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and next slide here, which is, which is the, the first project we did just before the millennium. Uh, my uh, oldest son was was basically uh, born already, so that informed me as a father to design this typology uh, for my son, not directly, he went to another uh, preschool, but for, for peers. And so and this show here is different than the previous shows. We're not going to explain what we see, but we actually get you excited about wondering what it is, and we're going to talk about for whom this all might, might be interesting, and we're thinking it should be above and beyond architects. Um, this here obviously is a, is a model we made, um, and there is a north era at the very bottom right. So orientation is really a key and has you know, an impact, and otherwise we will tell you on site why the building is positioned the way you see it indicated here. And let's move on to the next slide. Um, what else do we see in DeSoto when we go? Well, we're seeing a steel structure that's being built, but we see very clearly that there's an orientation in the way that the roof is tilted and it's open on one side. And obviously, I don't know exactly what this building is going to look like when it's finished because I haven't been there, but I know that that's going to be something that uh, is going to be very pertinent. And one of the things that we're going to see again and again in this discussion is the necessity for, at the certain times of year, gathering as much solar energy as possible during the winter, capturing that inside to help warm you up. And then during the summer, there are going to be reasons that it isn't quite as bright on that side, but you want to also insulate from the cold wind that's going to be blowing usually from certain directions. And we're going to see more of that as we yeah, go yeah. along. And, and this picture here is it could get uh, structural engineers excited, right? So why, and so in the Department of engineering uh, the, 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 the civil engineers, right? So yeah. why do you use a certain system here? So we will then Correct. tell you guys about that when we're there. Yeah. And next slide is how that, that got infilled. So this is for material scientists or for artists. How do surfaces, you know, what, what are their meaning? What is their sort of um, strategic um, implementation in the project? Um, next slide. Um, you know, for code people, um, this is interesting because that was built at a time when they were discussing either the federal government or the state weren't obligated to adopt what here is the American Disability Act, ADA. So it opened the opportunity to have this sort of two-story experiences in the kindergarten without having to build an elevator. And obviously the, the cons of that are, you know, obvious, but what could be the pros of that? And we would find out once we visit it. Yeah, and you know, I also will say too, as you just mentioned, not only are the aesthetics of these materials important, but how they perform is important too. Yeah. So you want something that looks appealing, you want something that people want to be in as a building, mm -hmm. but you also are always considering what is this going to do in terms of heating, cooling, the comfort, and the livability yeah, yeah, of yeah. what this is? Yeah, one other aspect is, and that's even another code, is acoustics, because you got these little young screaming voices, you know, and so you got to keep that within moderation. So we will tell you actually interesting details in the top right. So what informed that acoustical ceiling there? It's not off the shelf, that's customized, but everything within a very kind of restricted budget because these are public projects, right? 
Yeah, and I can also point out too that there are codes for fire yep. and there are codes for evacuation. Um, those things come into play too, particularly yep. for schools. Yep, exactly. So you as an architect had to take all that into yep. account. And we will share that. It could be very um, in instructive for potential emerging uh, people. So next slide here. Um, is this this um, I was I'm introducing three terms with this slide that you got very excited about and they're they're called EBD evidence-based design um, LCA life cycle assessment and POE post occupancy evaluation and that's terms that Americans came up with and basically all means you look at how buildings perform after they have been constructed Right. We're going to look at that, and, and what did they do to this wall that got you excited? <laughs> well, I thought this was pretty amusing because, as I was saying earlier, we've got this connection of Germany and, and the Hawaiian Islands in various unexpected ways. And this is a, a mural that was painted on the walls quite some time after this building was built. And this isn't part of the preschool. It's part of a, a, an area of the, of the complex for older kids. But it has Hawaiian or tropical themes painted on it, and it's called The Island. And so, it, in addition to the fantasy things of the, of the monkey with the key to get into the treasure chest, there's also a volcanic island in the background like the Hawaiian Islands. And it's got palm trees and it's got a sunset and all this other stuff. Germans longing for the tropics, the South Seas and the Hawaiian Islands. So for that to show up in Germany is always very interesting and amusing to me. And as you pointed out, nobody knew at the time, but you as one of the architects were gonna go from Germany to a tropical island. <laughs> exactly, they must have known, right? No, yeah. So well. next slide um, is the final one of this one. Uh, we actually call this building type what you call the, the next stage in sort of the process in, in schooling the kindergarten. We call these preschool ones kindergarten. And either way, they're close enough. But the term that you adopted, kindergarten, is a German word that you literally adopted. So it means you give equal emphasis to the outdoors than the indoors. And here's a picture from that sort of official website from the organization that runs the kindergarten. We're also going to deliver a couple of readings here about peer reviews of the projects. Don't worry, as you said, you know, several are in English, but some are in German. So we don't require you to speak German because <laughs> I'm going to translate. But you, know, you could look into one or the other one and spice it up. And you know, if I can just point out something too, when I was in elementary school, uh, I went to classrooms, I attended classrooms that were very similar in construction to this that you built, but the ones that I was in were from the 1950s. Mm -hmm. And they had a very similar structure and they also, each classroom had its own little garden or yard behind it. And this was part of a complex that located at Punahou School, which has now been demolished. But it precedes yours by quite some time, wow. but it's got a lot of similarities. Thank you, I take this as a big compliment. <laughs> Next slide. Um, again, this one was built before the millennium. Uh, we Germans weren't quite as strict on uh, energy uh, perform building performance, but by the time we were building this next one here, that was 10 years after, Germans had mandated for many of the municipalities to make these public buildings off the grid we're using the toughest um, energy efficiency standard in the world, the Pacifos standard. It means 15 kilowatt hours per square meter per year, which for non-scientists means the size of a hairdryer, so almost nothing for heating and cooling. So this is what you know fascinates you, that buildings have to get by in the winter in freaking cold, which we might face when we go there in January. And how do they do that? And we find out once we are there, mm -hmm. in, you know, real time and experiencing it with all our senses. Mm -hmm. And we'll go on to the next slide. Um, again, we, we're talking about structure. Um, each of these buildings has a different structure intentionally. What you know, we as as it should be. You you basically evaluate what you have done before, and then you think you should do it better. So this became a, a light wood frame. Uh, system here all prefabricated and craned in as you can see at this point it's it's a beefed up balloon frame American system that's actually insulated with shredded newspapers with cellulose uh, and, and when I looked at this picture I asked you is there any steel structure inside that and you just said no there isn't no. I was misled a little bit because there's a girder across the top which is purely there for being yeah. able to lift this prefab 
yeah. whole, uh, wall structure in place. And something else I think I should bring up, which I mentioned to you earlier, I asked you about, uh, on the based on the success or the construction of that first school building, your firm was then asked to do two more. And so that is something that you got into as a little sort of specialty. Yeah. And those are the buildings that we're looking at today. Yeah, yeah that's true. Next slide um, shows us the enclosure. Um, as you, you know, again, different to here, uh, the north side gets hit by the brisk, uh, you know, winter winds, so you got to keep it rather opaque and rather closed. Um, you have to work all these systems in, so we will elaborate on that and investigate in that. Let's go to the next slide. And then to the other side, to the south, um, you open it to the max but have to put glazed in uh, different than here uh, because you can't have that heat escape. But it's basically, as we talked, the educational process, so it's obviously also for the interest of interest for the Department of Education, for example, for the College of Education, for educators, because how does it inform, how does sort of space like that inform um, the upbringing of, of, of kids and in this case, I've been sharing with you that the kids actually go home and educate their parents. So a, a, re a reverse way than it usually is because they point out to that most likely water radiance furnace they have in front of the window and ask their parents, what is that? And the parents say, well, it's, it's a furnace. And they said, well, we don't need that. And why don't they? Well, two things. One, because you've got these big open windows to gather the sunlight when it's coming through. And you also have all the people inside it because all of us human beings are always giving off heat. Yeah. So we heat our environment as well as the sun heating our environment. So you can capture all that heat. And one thing that also really strikes me is the difference between classrooms of the early 20th century versus something like this. Mm -hmm. Classrooms traditionally were always closed off. You didn't want kids looking outside and being distracted. And of course, they didn't have the capacity technologically to do that. So you had small windows because everybody's got to be focused on learning and the teacher. This is a different situation in which, as you were saying, you want the outside to be part of the learning experience. Yeah. And there are certain things we can, when we travel, we can literally sort of adopt and, and use for us. For example, here, that the green that's on the trees, which over there is deciduous, so it's only on there in the summertime, but here it's on the trees all the time. You can really use that as effective shading, right? Yes. To keep the space cool, which we need all the time, because the big problem is that schools tend to overheat. So use the natural, the best sort of shading and the cheapest is, 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 is trees. Mm -hmm. And next slide. Um, we also then will visit it from the inside, obviously, and we'll look again, how does it wear and tear? How does it work? How are the surfaces basically a background, a backdrop for what should be the emphasis um, on a daily basis, which is the expression of the children. And here is uh, two visitors that we're gonna explain who they were in a little bit. And in the middle is the director of the school, Mrs. Sivitza. So she will be with us and explain it from her point of view, which might be slightly different than ours, yeah. actually. Yeah, of course. Next slide is the final one. So this is a condition here, again, uh, that we never have here, where the leaves are off the tree. We will find that condition when we're there. Maybe we'll find snow, which we see in a little bit with the last project. And you see how that sort of sun is basically um, um, helping or majorly sort of heating the building in the, in the winter time. Again, a couple of readings assigned at the very top, and we move on to the next slide. The third project is uh, some years after that, we were asked to do another a passive house building for one of Germany's oldest universities in Göttingen. And this project we've been sort of referencing to here and there and shows this is sort of sculptured out of the topography of that specific uh, almost botanical arboreum garden of the university. And next slide, um, it's showing us again, another tectonic again for the uh, structural engineers, for the civil engineers. First was in steel, second one was in wood frame. This is in prefab concrete or prefabricated. Direct similarity uh, to Great Pacific Rocky Mountain Precast we have here on the island, which we always say for the projects we imagine and envision they would provide the technology, right? Yeah, that. yeah. So next slide. 
uh, we will bring plans so we will we can read you know and, and learn about the comprehensiveness of all the parts and pieces and components and how they all come together uh, and the different disciplines as we've been talking of we want this to be interdisciplinary break outside of our architectural ivory tower and and simulate and tour as we as you want would work on these projects as we worked on this project because we needed a structural engineer we needed a mechanical engineer we had a passive house consultant we had a landscape architect so we're going to talk about these sort of collaborative nature of these interdisciplinary interactions that um, only if you do that you can um, achieve results like that you know and i think the other thing that we can mention is you just said earlier how does it actually work in practice because talking to the, the head of the school is going to tell you you know this works well this doesn't we yeah. need more space here we need more storage space this whatever those things are Absolutely. that's where you're going to hear yeah. uh, despite just your concepts beforehand yeah. what did it actually turn into exactly yeah and next slide um, and that's the condition we might hit right because January there's no winter this year but there might be one <laughs> and so we will see I mean you said you know the kids can only use the outdoor classroom a little bit but they do when they go out but then when it gets too cold they go inside so the picture on the left is when we had three weeks of blizzards and no sun so how in the world can you make this happen that without heating or with net only natural heating as the 40 kids being little furnaces and then the sun that isn't even there for three weeks how can that happen that you get it that cozy and comfortably behind like this little cuddling uh, corner they created themselves with these cushions right, right. and I think too that again technologically how, one of the ways you do that is by having multiple panes of glass yeah, yeah we don't yeah. really have to do that here no. but in cold climates you need the insulation of of air between two panes or three sometimes exactly. pieces of glass and that's one of the ways you can have snow on the outside but yeah. not be frozen on the inside yeah, yeah. and the condition we always have next slide we have there too we won't experience that at that time. They have to come at another time. We're experiencing that, where the same structure has to keep out the sun, but to keep the view as achieved in this case. And next slide. Um, there is a landscape arc, uh, aspect here as well, in a very particular way. What's that one? This well, this building, although it isn't immediately apparent, is actually built partly underground. So it was built on a hill. It's built on a slope. It's gone it, it's sort of carved out of the hill and then it's got a berm on top of it with a totally green roof and we talk about green roofs as being something that we desire because you've got plants living on the roof that are transpiring and doing good things well that's what this building is it's almost entirely a green roofed building so that way again this should appeal to the landscape architects we have a new landscape program so they can see firsthand this is an intensive green roof that's different to an extensive and we will make that comparison and that distinction and next slide um, again we have tested this this is uh, Chris Chiqueta who had we, we had him on a show that was called jungleism some uh, many shows ago and and Siraj uh, Sharif here who were coming on their initiative when they were doing the Copenhagen and they said Martin we want to finally see what you've been talking about here and then we want to check it out so here's Mrs. Savitza the director so again uh, that was fun and they liked it so we thought we offer this uh, in a more formal way next slide and uh, we will move on to the the big city one over and that is Hamburg it's only an hour train ride away and there's a lot to learn from there. We did a show in the in a previous we did one episode in the, in the previous show that was called Urban Transcendence, and we called this one here uh, Hamburg's Harbor City, uh, Germany's Kakaako, or uh, you know or similar. And and there's a peer from uh, my uh, Prairie days in Nebraska, uh, Annette, who uh, did the same exchange I did a year after me, and she's been part of that development. And there's a lot to learn. From there, uh, what to do better, um, and you know, as far as school, there's a very urban school. We know that the Department of Education want to implement something like that and now do an urban school in Kakaako. So this is a place where we can learn from that because it's already been implemented. Uh, you see that big cruise ship there? We did one show about. We called it horizontal mm -hmm. high rises, right? And yeah. now they're. You know, in the spotlight of the yeah. uh, corona yeah. containing, <laughs> quarantining, yeah. you know, 
this is the the new the the the, the redux of the Queen Mary that uh, goes straight to uh, New York City and it always docks there. And what impact that has on that building next to it, we will then talk about when we're there. Yeah. Amongst other things, right? Yeah, and there's a really interesting story as to how many cities in the world, which are port cities, yeah. have had to redevelop large areas because once container shipping came in, their previous dock facilities became obsolete. So all of those areas uh, are ripe for redevelopment, and they're mm -hmm. being redeveloped in yeah. a lot of different places. Yeah, yeah. And last slide here, uh, what is the final deliverable of the course? Well, one of the final deliverables is going to be, if I'm correct, a think tech show or at least a think tech like show in which they're going to do a video production is that right and that's what what our you know founding uncle jay encouraged us he said why don't you let the students do one and of course we will tutor them and train them because we've been doing it for a while so that would be then very attractive maybe to the college of communication of journalism right? oh yeah how do you sort of wrap up things and and basically portray and communicate yep. the learning outcome of this week to then be always and forever YouTubed and available and you can show and share to your peers and later on to your children and grandchildren. Yeah. So with that, uh, hopefully we get you excited to join us. Uh, it's gonna happen uh, in January again next year. Uh, sign up early, first come, first serve. And we will uh, uh, offer, if you can't make it for this one, maybe if we're you know, filled up already, uh, we're gonna have some alternatives for you. We're going to have four more uh, study uh, trips planned uh, uh, for different typologies that our firm has uh, case studied. So stay tuned for that. Uh, we're going to talk about them next in the next three shows. So uh, hopefully you just solo then will join us for one or the other. And uh, I think I'll go to one of the ones that's happening in a warmer time of the right. year than January. Well, we, we can do April because April okay. is probably pretty okay. likely. And, yeah. and that's, a, that's a show that you will like as well that has a lot to do. And we don't tell you guys yet. You got to tune in again. So uh, until then, um, hope we see you again. And um, uh, stay um, tropically exotic and also temperately interested because again um, saying that uh, some of our brightest uh, emerging talents might not want to or can stay on the island they might need to work somewhere else and as you pointed out 60 percent of the world climates and culture are likewise the one we're going to talk about so this might help you out in your career anyways so i'll see you next week for another episode of human humane architecture we give you a little hint, we're going to continue a little bit in this sort of realm and talk about extended education. And until then, bye-bye.